Well, hello everybody and welcome to our online service here with North County Church. I want to welcome those of you that are a part of the North County family and anybody else that is joining with us who might be a part of our extended family, uh, maybe from within our community or beyond, and anybody that's joining us for the first time. Uh, we welcome you. We hope that you've already been encouraged by what we've done here today, and we hope that as we get into God's Word, you're drawn closer uh, to His heart. So, I want to encourage you to turn over to 1 Thessalonians. I'm going to be sharing these scriptures on the screen as well, but I love it when people open their Bibles and read along and get into the Word of God. So we're going to be in 1 Thessalonians in a series that I have entitled Living in Light of Christ's Return. So this is the third part of that series. And I want to start with a story that I read not too long ago about a little boy who was taken by his father one Saturday to a museum. His dad thought, you know, I'll do something educational, get a little culture into my son. So one Saturday took him to the museum and they're there going down aisle after aisle looking at artifacts from eras that are way in the past, ancient history. And after about an hour of that, the little boy looks up at his dad and says, Dad, can we leave here and go somewhere where things are real? I think sometimes people feel that way when they're reading the Bible. We read this book of letters that are 2,000 years old and some of the literature in the Bible much older than that. And we wonder how, how can what was written so long ago have such relevance to us today? And yet people discover that when they open the Word of God and begin to read that the issues that are addressed, the needs of man that are spoken to, are the same that we deal with today, and it is as up-to-date as 2020. And it speaks to our heart in such a special and unique way because it's the Word of God. And Paul makes this point in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 when he speaks to this church, to these Christians, about how they receive the Word of God. Now, we've called this series Living in light of Christ's return because of the strong emphasis in this letter on the second coming of Jesus Christ. Followers of Jesus Christ should live with one foot in this world and one foot in the world to come. We, we should be fully engaged with this life, but we should also live with a very sharp awareness of eternity. One day, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ will come again and he'll break through the sky and he'll bring everything as we know it to a screeching halt and he'll bring to an end the present age that we're living in and will bring about the age to come. So we who are believers who live with this double perspective on life itself and on this world itself, we live with that according to a certain wisdom that it gives us. It shapes our priorities, it shapes our schedules, it shapes our dreams, and it shapes our decisions that we make in our work and in our personal life, and it shapes the way we have concern for and interact with our neighbors. It fuels our hearts for the gospel. So in 1 Thessalonians, Paul is calling us to both action and anticipation. One of the issues that he addresses in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians is idleness because it seems that some had taken to heart this teaching about the second coming of Christ and their anticipation was, quite correctly, that he could come at any time. And yet, what it led them to do was be idle. They just thought, we're going to sit back and wait for Christ to come again. And so in both the first letter and the second letter, Paul had to address idleness. Paul says, no, we live differently. We live with this full anticipation of the return of Jesus Christ, but we live active, engaged lives in the present. We fully anticipate his return, but we're active and working in the present. So with that, let's read again. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're going to read uh, verses 1 down to verse 3 of this letter. Here in the letter, Paul says, Paul and Silas and Timothy 
to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, real quickly, I just want to make an observation about this greeting. We usually don't spend too many time or too much time looking at greetings uh, when we're preaching about a text, but I want to make just an observation here. I love it that in this letter, the letter comes not just from Paul, but it comes from Paul, Silas, and Timothy. Timothy and Silas had just returned to Paul with their report from Thessalonica. And what Paul demonstrates here is a humility, a humble spirit. And when Paul joins these brothers' names to his in writing the letter, he shows we're co-workers in the gospel. Now, he was the apostle. His instruction carried a weight and an authority that the others didn't necessarily and yet by attaching their names, it shows that they had input into the letter that he was sending to Thessalonica. He valued them and he valued their shared ministry. Paul didn't stay aloof from his co-workers. He didn't separate himself from those that he was working alongside or elevate himself above them. He didn't make distinctions. They were co-workers. And so it impresses me that when Paul could honestly share credit and identify himself with the team that he was working with, he did it. As a matter of fact, as you move forward into the second chapter in 1 Thessalonians, you're going to see some interesting things about the language Paul uses. Let's read in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 at verses 3 and 4. You'll notice there, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. Now, as you read from verses 1 to 6, I didn't read all of it. I just pulled verses 3 and 4 out. Paul is speaking here about their motives. And their motives, first and foremost, was to please God, not people. And as you read this particular section in chapter 2, there is nothing manipulative whatsoever in Paul's approach in ministry. And there's no self-aggrandizement. He's not seeking celebrity status. He just wanted to please God, and he wasn't afraid to say, we, we, our, our. And as you read chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it is we and our over and over again. You find it most prominent here, but you find it throughout the letter. I, I just love that about Paul. And we need that at every level in church life. For the person preaching, to the person leading a ministry, we need to appreciate that we're in it together. We need each other's support. We need each other's feedback. We need each other's input. We need each other's accountability. We need to be humble enough that we don't try to own the ministry that we're serving in or leading in and that we don't shut others out. Now, we'll all have different roles and responsibilities based on giftedness, but we value each person's role in the body of Christ. So I just think that's an observation that speaks well to our modern Christian scene where we can easily put people up on pedestals. When you consider who it is that's going to be a spiritual influence in your life, ask yourself, whose kingdom are they asking me to build with them? Is it about Jesus Christ or is it about them? Now, you might say, Kevin, that's a lot from an introduction, perhaps, but I think it's a reminder that we could all stand to consider from time to time, regardless of where it is we serve in the body of Christ. We are in this 
together. And as Jesus said in Matthew 23, we are all just brothers and sisters. We may have different roles. Paul was an apostle. He had a special and unique role as the other apostles did as well. But in the final analysis, we're all brothers and sisters in Christ and on level ground at the foot of the cross. Now, let's spend our time again in chapter 1 at verses 2 and 3. Let's read this text, these two verses again, and then we're going to make some observations today as we move forward in this series. Paul said, We always thank God for all of you and continually mention you in our prayers. I mentioned last week, wouldn't you love to see Paul's prayer list? We remember before our God and Father your work produced by faith, your labor prompted by love, and your endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. So after Paul assures them of his continued prayers for them, he says something at verse 3 that we might read through too quickly and that we might miss the power of. He says that these Christians that he and his co-workers remember before God in prayer had three characteristics that he points out to them that they're aware of, but he is affirming it in the life of their church. He speaks about their work produced by faith, their labor prompted by love, and their endurance inspired by their hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those are three impressive things. Now, we might just kind of pass through a text like this really quickly and miss the power of the text. There is a wealth of meaning here in these three statements that I want us to think about today. I want you to notice first those three words that kind of stand out in the text. Faith, love, and hope. Now, where do you recall finding those three words together, strung together, in Scripture. Think about it for a minute. That's right. I know somebody out there's got it. You're, you've already identified it. It is what we often call the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 13, where Paul said, and now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. I want you to think about these words for just a couple of moments. These are abstract Nouns. How do we make these abstract nouns concrete? How do we give them legs to walk with, hands to work with? How do we see these abstract nouns become alive? How do we, how do we make them real to us? How do we move them from just being a feeling in our heart or maybe a value up in our mind to something that is fleshed out in the way we serve our Lord? I'm reminded of the story of the contractor who had five children. And he loved children, but he'd been contracted to construct a sidewalk in a new neighborhood. And so he puts in the sidewalk and goes home and comes back the next morning to find out that a bunch of kids had walked into fresh concrete and they'd left their footprints all in it. And man, he was mad and he was talking loud and angrily about it with one of his assistant said to him, hey, I thought you loved children. He said, I do love children. I love them in the abstract, but not in the concrete. I know, that, that's, that's one that makes you groan just a little bit. But the question is, how do you get these abstract ideas and make them concrete? How do you get these words into something that is firm and real? Well, Here's what Paul does. He talks about three ways those attributes, those words moved this church to action. Remember, we're called to both anticipate and we're called to action. So first what Paul does is he talks about their works of faith. Let's talk about what that means for just a couple of moments. Works of faith. He said, back at chapter 1 and verse 9, 
or I should say not back but forward in verse 9 of chapter 1, you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. What Paul does is he gives us a concrete picture of how work and faith go together. Faith leads to action. Faith leads to deeds. Faith leads to doing something, otherwise it isn't faith. There has been an ongoing discussion among Christian people about the role of works and faith and how these two go together. And we're all mindful of Ephesians chapter 2 at verses 8 and 9 where Paul's very clear that we are saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest anyone should boast. Right? We hear that scripture, we read that scripture, we cherish what it says. We cannot merit or earn our salvation in any way. And yet, James comes along. And James writes in James chapter 2, at verse 18, Show me your faith without deeds, and I'll show you my faith by my deeds. And then he even goes on to get a little more powerful or stronger than that, and he says at verse 20, Faith without deeds or works is useless. And verse 24 of James 2, that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. So faith and works, they go together. James is saying what we believe determines what we do, and what we do shows what we believe. Faith is the response of a person to the Word of God. And when a person responds to the Word of God, they start living in a different way. They start walking by faith. Faith always leads to doing, at least true and genuine faith does. On one occasion, Jesus told a crowd, Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. This is in John chapter 6. And then he goes on to say at verses 27 down to verse 29, they asked him, based on what he had said, what must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. He didn't say that you come to God by your works and earn favor with God by your works. He said you come to God by your faith. And even believing in Jesus is a work of God. And then from there, that sets us on a course of living a certain way, of walking by faith, which has to do as well with doing. Let me illustrate it this way. Luke chapter 5, Peter and his friends, they'd been out fishing all night long, and they'd caught absolutely nothing. And then Jesus comes along. They're mending their nets. They're done for the night. They're ready to go home and get some sleep and some rest. And what does Jesus do? He tells them to launch out into the deep and let down their nets again. And what does Peter say? Peter said, but master, we have fished all night and have caught nothing. But then he added, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. You know what that is? That is a work of faith. That is acting and doing based on believing the word of God, based on Peter's faith in the one who spoke the word. He knew that Jesus was completely trustworthy and reliable. His Faith was in Jesus. He'd already seen enough that Jesus had done. And so if Jesus said it, he would do. He would act and work based upon his faith in Jesus. These Thessalonians in chapter 2 had received the word of God and they'd received it not as the word of men, but as the word of God, Paul said, which is exactly what it was. And Paul said, it is indeed at work in you who believe. So these Christians had turned to God from idols 
Uh, Paul didn't have to go there and say, hey, you know, it's just not right that you're worshiping idols. He went there and he preached Jesus Christ. Idolatry wasn't repulsive to these people as it was to a Jewish Christian like Paul, but when they heard Paul preach Christ, they believed God's word and they turned to God and turned away from their idols. They automatically turned to their idols. Their idols had lost all of their attraction and they'd come to learn these aren't gods at all and they turned to God to now live a life where they served the living God. Once they came to know the true and the living God, it didn't matter the cost, it didn't matter the stir that had been uh, stirred up in the community or the, the dust that had been kicked up, it didn't matter that there was persecution that it raised, it didn't matter the fact that it pulled them from their familiar and comfortable ways of living. If God is God, our faith will dictate now what we do. And as believers in Christ, we as a church should be characterized as people who do works that God has called us to do because we have faith. And if Jesus is Lord, if we put our faith in him, then everything he speaks is instructive to us. Everything that he speaks directs us. And our obedience is a response to our faith. Our actions are a response to our faith. And we work the works of God because we have faith in who God is and who his son Jesus Christ is. So they had now started living a life of works that were works of faith. If you trust Jesus here, you can trust Jesus in every way and you can live a life of obedience, doing everything that he's told you to do. It pleases and honors God and these works are works of faith. So that's the first phrase. The second phrase then, uh, that he uses to describe this church as he said he talked about their labor prompted by love. Uh, God doesn't save us by works as we said just a couple of moments ago he saves us by grace but when you think about it his grace is his love in action. And that word labor is an interesting word. They had works of faith, deeds, things that they did by faith because they trusted the Word of God. But they labored in the Lord. And this is another word. And this word labor is a word for strenuous, roll up your sleeve, get your hands dirty kind of labor, the kind of labor that makes a person weary. These individuals in this church were willing to work hard to make and keep commitments to serve and to expend their energy in serving God. There was a sacrifice in living this new life for Jesus Christ. You might remember uh, back in chapter 2 or, or chapter 1 at verse 9, as I said, they, they didn't just turn from idols. That's repentance. They turned to God from idols to serve the true and the living God. So this is a church made up of people who are willing to get their hands dirty and work hard for the Lord. Now, what does that say to a people who sometimes do all that they can to try to avoid hard work and to make life as easy as possible? Well, it says that God calls us to labor. They're a model church, Paul goes on to say. What does this say? What does this say to our modern consumer Christian world that we live in? Some modern Christians seem to want churches where somebody else has done all of the hard labor so that they can come in now, slide into that church, and reap the rewards. It's kind of a you build it and we'll come to it kind of a mindset. But the labor here that Paul describes is strenuous work that these Christians were willing to do on behalf of the kingdom, on behalf of one another, to advance the purposes of God. But here's the deal. This labor isn't just labor. It is their labor of love. What prompted their labor was love. Love will lead to labor. And here's the deal. 
Labor is hardly labor when you're laboring in love. And when love is missing from the equation, labor is just a big burden and just a big pain in the neck that's got to be done. But labor that is prompted by love is hardly labor. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So for those who keep his commandments out of love, the commandments are not burdensome. But if you remove love from the equation, they just become a list of rules. And then everything becomes a burden. But when you're laboring prompted by love, it becomes a joy to even weary yourself in the work of God. Haven't you experienced that when you have served alongside with a brother or sister in Christ or with a group of Christians and you've worked hard and at the end of the day you are absolutely worn out? But it's what they, uh, what they used to call down south a good tired. Why? Because the labor is prompted by a love in your heart for God and a love in your heart for others. And let me say this, a church that's filled with people of faith and love is a church that doesn't have to plead with people to work and serve. Where there's a problem of work and labor, that it's an indicator of a bigger problem with faith and love. There is nothing wrong with being weary and tired. Jesus got weary and he rested and we need to rest. But it reminds me of something I read that Dwight Moody said. He was absolutely worn out. He'd been on a preaching circuit, and he'd come back, and he had a meeting to go to, and somebody had pointed out to him that he looked wearied and tired and that he shouldn't go to the meeting. And he said, I am weary in the work, but I'm not weary of the work. So these believers... They had labor that impressed Paul and Silas and Timothy, and it was labor prompted by love. That's the motive. All right, the third item that he mentions. Finally, we're going to talk about their endurance inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. This theme of living in light of the return of Jesus starts right here in this particular place in 1 Thessalonians. And what does his promised return bring to our lives? Well, we already said anticipation, but it's this word hope. And when we talk about hope, we're not talking about wishful thinking. You know, I, I hope I win the lottery. Yeah, that's wishful thinking. Or I hope I get an A on that test tomorrow. Did you study for it? Well, not really. Well, that's wishful thinking. When we use the word hope, it's not, well, I hope so. Hope in Scripture is a certainty in our hearts, an assurance, because we put our faith in Jesus and we trust his word. We trust his promise. And one of the promises that he made that features in this letter is the promise that he would return. Hope is powerful. It's essential. Human beings seek hope like a moth seeks light. It's intrinsic to, to who we are. Neuroscientist Tali Shiro argues that hope is absolutely essential for our survival, that it's hardwired into our brains, arguing that it can be the difference between living a healthier life versus one trapped by despair. And through study, certain truth has come out. Studies have shown how hopeful college kids, for example, get higher GPAs and are more likely to graduate if they're hopeful that they can put that to use and have a career after college. Hopeful athletes perform better on the field. They cope better with injuries and they have a greater mental adjustment when situations change. Employees who have hope in their personal future and in the mission of their company have a much lower rate of absenteeism. In one particular study of the elderly, those who said they felt hopeless were more than twice as likely to die during the study follow-up period than those who were more 
hopeful. So it's pretty clear. Hope is powerfully cataclytic, and more than an emotion, it's an essential life tool. And the theme of hope runs through Scripture. And here's the deal. You and I don't put our hope in things here. We, we might hope, as some of these examples modeled a bit ago, in things here, in a future career, uh, in a family. We might put hope in some of those things, of course. But we hope in something that is absolutely certain. We put our hope fully in the promise that Christ will return. That one day, as we said at the beginning of this sermon, Christ will come in the clouds and life as we know it in this age will come to a screeching halt and the believer will enter into the life to come. These Thessalonians had worshipped idols that offered no real hope. No hope at all. Certainly no lasting hope. I mean, really, the idols could offer nothing, but they would worship the idols in the hope that maybe their businesses would prosper more. Maybe their fields would, would bring a good harvest. Maybe, maybe their families would be able to produce offspring. They had all these reasons that they worshipped and sought to appease these idols, but those idols were powerless to bring anything about for this age and certainly nothing for the life to come. But now they were serving the true and the living God. And now they were anticipating the return of Jesus Christ. And all of their idol worship was in the past. It was just wishful thinking for something here that wouldn't last anyway. But now their hope was fixed on something eternal and it gave them a power in the present. And it gave them a power to endure everything that had already come at them and everything that would come at them. They had an endurance that was the result of their hope in Jesus Christ. They had learned to live with one foot in this world and one foot in the world to come. Hope is a confident assurance of what's up ahead. A couple of scriptures that might encourage you. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Peter said, Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. I want you to think about Ephesians chapter 1, verse 18. Paul said, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess for he who promised is faithful. Romans 8, 24, in this hope we're saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And he's talking about the return of Christ when this present age is over and everything is fully redeemed and Christ comes again to take us to be with him for all eternity. Hope. It is the constant theme of the Christian. It's the constant theme of Scripture. And endurance inspired by hope is an endurance that comes because we know Jesus Christ is coming one day and everything here in comparison to eternity becomes light and momentary, as Paul said in another place. We can find out how to endure anything if we have a clear enough why. Why would we endure it? And the why is that Jesus is coming again and we live our lives to please the Lord and to prepare ourselves for that day. Why, when things got hard, didn't they quit? Because they trusted that one day Jesus Christ would come and he'd deal with their adversaries and he would deal with their situation and he'd take them home. Hope. Hope will enable you to endure anything. Persecution, weariness, disappointment, grief, failure, a constant temptation, a tough relationship, a serious stumble, a pandemic, rejection from non-believers, temporary loneliness. 
Hope will enable us to endure anything because we know that none of those things, none of those things have the last word, nor are they the final chapter of life here. Christ is coming, and our redemption, our redemption will be full and complete. Well, works of faith, labors of love, endurance inspired by hope. Now we know why faith, hope, and love are so powerful and so enduring. The Thessalonian church was a model church in many ways, but know, know this, that the same power and message are, are, are ours. The values that they lived are as real today as they were then. Or I should say, the values they lived then are as real today for us. Faith, hope, love. Be inspired, church family. We'll go deeper next week. Now, today at 4 o'clock, 4 o'clock, uh, we're going to have our gathering at Grape Day Park in Escondido. Hope you can join us. Bring a mask, bring a friend, bring a Bible. We're going to continue the series, Who is God? And tonight we're going to talk about God's unchanging nature. So, if you're watching this, and maybe you're new to all of this, you would be more than welcome to join us tonight. Bring your own chair. It's pretty informal. We socially distance uh, from one another, both in our seating and interactions. But we worship God, and God's Word will be shared. If we can help you, to know more about Jesus Christ. Maybe the things we've described about the Thessalonian church, their salvation, uh, their joy, their love, their hope, maybe that struck a chord in your heart and you want to know more about how to have a relationship with God through Jesus like they did, like we have as Christians, let us know how we can help. You can ask a question or ask for help or information by sending an email to info at northcountycfc.com. You can get more information about our church and our faith at northcountycfc.com. I should say the email is info at northcountycfc.org. It's on, on the screen right over here. And we have a YouTube channel that has a lot of good teaching information, a lot of previous messages on it. And if you go to that YouTube channel and subscribe to it, maybe you're watching this on it. Uh, then subscribe to it and look through some of those other messages. Those are designed to help you grow in your knowledge of God. Have a blessed week. We'll continue in 1 Thessalonians next Sunday morning.